was asserted by one branch and that assertion was permitted to stand, it gradually came to be assumed and as such had the capacity to be a starting premise in subsequent con contests between the branches. So again, long history of rhetoric, negotiation, debate, sort of, we have inherited a, a long, long tradition of, of debate and discourse, and so what we now see right now as, as the roles of the three branches of government is, is it has been rhetorically constituted and will continue to change and, and as, as, you know, until, you know, humanity is, is, um, dies off in about a hundred years. Um, so that's, that's the first bit. Then also, um, uh, Campbell and Jameson, uh, talk about, uh, obviously rhetorical types or genres and that they have for the most part emerged organically. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the Constitution that, that it doesn't really say exactly what, there are certain mandates, uh, like an annual message, but a lot of that stuff has, has been more sort of through practice. Um, and so that's the next bullet point. And then, uh, basically, um, one of the things that I think is particularly important in this uh, first section, uh, before they move to genre, uh, is the idea of how they are particularly interested in public communication, not private, um, but public communication, speeches and other forms of discourse to the masses, the citizenry, to all the public, uh, and how, uh, how all that stuff sort of creates, in a sense, um, uh, a certain sense of who we are. Because the president does not only constitute the presidency, through his discourse, uh, but also the people, constituting the people. And so I say paragraphs um, 19 and 20 uh, and 21 are very, very important here. Um, so this book is about presidential rhetoric. This is actually 18. Specifically, it is about the kinds of rhetoric that have come to typify the presidency from the nation's beginning at the president, present. And what follows, we look at the presidency as it emerged through rhetorical practices uh, and so they talk about how things have become more customary um, versus mandated, um, and that they're interested in public discourse, not private discourse. Um, and they talk about how each type uh, of, of, of discourse uh, or genre becomes particularly special. Um, and then, uh, then you know, when they uh, they. Okay, so rhetoric is important. Rhetoric is important. Rhetoric is important. Rhetoric, even though we see it as the, the art of persuasion, what, what folks are doing, again, is not just persuading folks to, to you know, uh, support certain policies, et cetera, et cetera, but also, perhaps implicitly, uh, you know, what does, what rhetoric creates shapes and invites us to see the world in a particular way. In what sense, invents what it means to be present. It invents, uh, it creates, it frames, it constitutes who we are as a people. And that's why uh, in Mark, paragraph 28, um, 22, and then 23, uh, they talk about how um, presidents have constituted people in different ways, so uh, we would support their various policies. Frequently, that identity, the identity of the people, this is in paragraph 22, um, presidents often describe people as peace-loving, generous, and democratic, but in some cases, their rhetoric involves dramatic redefinitions. Uh, they, talk, they talk about how Lincoln um, framed us in a particular way after uh, the people, after the, the Civil War, to try to uh, reconcile the nation. Uh, and there's lots of really interesting things in here about the constitution of the people. Um, it's probably captured best in, in, um, in 24 and 25. The, th the thing is, and this is, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, but hopefully you, you get it. I love the stuff of Murray Edelman. Uh, Edelman. Um, his quote is, is that political language is political reality. So, so we are, presidents are, Congress is, whatever, through discourses creating the reality of our situation, the social reality of our situation, how we see uh, all this stuff. And then it talks about how, you know, um, if an audience conceives itself as caring for others, particularly those less fortunate, and as dedicated to the notion that when individuals cannot care for themselves, the state ought to, then it will favor the kinds of programs championed by FDR and Lyndon Johnson. 
By contrast, if the audience sees itself as committed primarily to free enterprise and personal responsibility and not caring for other people, it will oppose much of the New Deal and the war on poverty in favor of the Reagan agenda of getting government off the backs of the people. Um, so, so the so important bit here, uh, these are very, very important paragraphs, I say, and, and you can read the, the bullet points here. But it says, in this book, we examine the roles the presidents have invited Americans to assume, the people they have asked us to be. When we say that presidents constitute the people, we mean that all presidents have the opportunity to persuade us to conceive of ourselves in ways compatible with their views of government and the world. At the same time, presidents invite us to see them, the presidency, the country, and the country's role in specific ways. That's, that's, that's what this class is really all about, in a way. Um, of course, there's always multiple ways of, that, of seeing that within, a, within the same you know, country, very obviously. That's why some people are crazy and some people aren't. Um, okay. Hopefully you get the point there. They move on to talking about genre, generally the idea of the polis, which is the city-state, that this is all um, about public deliberation and public discourse, um, and how they're not terribly interested, again, in the private stuff, um, unless the private is made public, uh, which is not always the case. There's always going to be emails that are uh, lost or uh, things that are shredded. Um, I like shredded lettuce on tacos. Um, now, I would like to um, mention uh, that this, um, uh, this online lecture is brought to you by Hardee's. Uh, eat like you mean it. Those commercials are absolutely awful. I give them a hard time too. I go to Hardee's every day um, just to get a drink. Um, and they let me have free refills because I, I, I know all the people. They know my name. When I, they know my name. When I walk in, they yell Norm. <laughs> oh. Um, but, um, um, yeah. Those commercials are, are horrendous. Have you seen that jalapeno whatever burger? God, that's saying, ugh. Okay, genre. Basics on genre. I've already talked about this a lot. Um, it's in the syllabus and everything like that. Um, I've already, you know, it's basically this idea of structure and form, and they talk about, um, you know, they sort of justify their approaches uh, to looking at presidential discourse as form. They go back and, and talk about their own sort of uh, very... Um, sort of a watershed sort of um, book and um, rhetorical uh, theory and history, Form and Genre, Shaping Rhetorical Action, that came out in 1978. Um, and I've done a lot of work on, on genre and genre criticism. Um, but basically, we're looking at, you know, the idea of form, of patterns, of structures, and how they sort of invite uh, us to uh, expect uh, presidents, uh, in this case, to say and do certain things. Um, and this is the same example um, that I put in syllabus. Like, you know, we, we have the form of, of the good versus evil sort of mythology or the narrative. What do we expect to happen? Well, usually um, the, uh, the, the, the good guys win in the end. Uh, not always. But the, the basic idea is that through the, the whole history and the genealogy, so to speak, of uh, presidential speak making, uh, speak making, speech making, uh, we, we, they have created these genres, these expectations of, of, of you know, norms, of, of, of structure, of form. Um, so in a sense, a genre, and this is uh, from Rod Hart, um, is a class of messages sharing, because this is not straight, some of this stuff is not straight from your book, a class of messages sharing important structural and content features and, and which, as a class, creates special expectations in listeners. Uh, that's basically what I said. Um, and then, of course, I also put this in the syllabus, but from Sonja Foss on, on her very sort of uh, simple uh, cookie-cutter rhetorical criticism book, uh, again, talks about how, the, you know, when we have a genre, there are certain situational requirements, uh, there's uh, similar uh, situations call forth similar rhetoric, like when folks are elected president, 
they are going to give an inaugural address and we expect presidents to do so and to say certain things. Also, that gives the president an opportunity to, to craft the public as he or she would like to. So they support what it is that he or she wants to do. Um, and so there's also stylistic characteristics of you know, what kind of you know, lofty language or down-home language or whatever. There's, a lot of, there's lots of stuff going to that uh, or about all that type of stuff. And a lot of this stuff goes back to Aristotle and, and, um, uh, and uh, the authors do talk about that. Um, really, the first set of genres ever discussed came straight from Aristotle's book on rhetoric, uh, which is around here. It's a page-turner. If you ever have insomnia, read Aristotle. Um, but he talked about epideictic addresses, which are ceremonial speeches, forensic speeches, which are uh, court legal cases, and deliberative, which is more in the assembly. Now, all of these can sort of blur into one another, um, but I talk a little bit about um, here uh, the idea of uh, write about uh, epideictic um, and what that's supposed to do. And ideally, uh, they say, for instance, that the first um, uh, genre we'll look at, the inaugural address, is, is more epideictic or ceremonial than, than anything else. So I have a little bit of information there that you can read. But basically, in this section, what, what they define genre and everything like that, and they, they again think um, this is a really good way to analyze and think about and learn about and evaluate and all that jazz uh, presidential rhetoric. Um, because, they say, presidential rhetoric it has been, a lot of it, institutionalized. So there are those norms, um, even as those norms are not necessarily constitutionally mandated. They have become uh, custom. And so uh, I do say that paragraph 15 is important here, uh, this notion that um, on one level then all criticism is generic criticism, that is, uh, analyzing form and genre, because even if one magically stumbled on, say, a group of sounds, note that one can say musical sounds or linguistic sounds, because those kinds of sounds or genres that bore, bore no relationship to any other group of sounds, one would immediately have to imagine a category, a genre, into which the newly found sound group could be placed. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a lot of different things, uh, paragraph uh, 18 and all, and 19, all that stuff is important. Um, in other words, this is 18 on page 15. As a tool in critical analysis, genre has a second pragmatic meaning, so we're not just looking at the, 